Well, uh, Peter, thank you very much for that indeed. Uh, and thank you for uh, all of you who've uh, come on. If any questions, please do have the chance. I'm going to ask one so that we've got a chance for people to come in. Peter, I'm interested in diversity and inclusion. You're well aware now as president of the institution uh, what an important issue it is for the institution. And I'm, I'm interested in your view of diversity and inclusion in the innovation process because um, you showed two books at the beginning of your, uh, of your talk there, one of them called Men, Missiles and Machines, and the other one called Six Great Engineers, who I imagine were also men. Um, I'm just wondering how you feel we could be doing more for the innovation process uh, by including a more diverse group of engineers. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much indeed, Colin. And first thing, uh, to do, well, as well as thanking those who have uh, taken the time to watch, also, a slight correction uh, at the end there, the quote I mentioned, doing things for a dollar and so on, was actually made in 1887, not 1847. So, apologies for that. But coming to your, to your question, uh, Colin, I, I think that the, the nature of engineering has actually changed quite radically over the past uh, sort of 40 or 50 years. Where, uh, you know, uh, in the middle of the, uh, the 20th century, it was, it was a fairly unprofessional, uh, that's the wrong word, it was quite heavy. Uh, and to a certain extent, quite a sort of dirty occupation. You know, factories were, were were not very welcoming places, uh, for example. So I, I think the nature of engineering has changed quite quite radically, and it's it's much more appealing uh, to, to to all people who might uh, you might not consider it otherwise. Um, but the main thing is that we face some pretty uh, pretty fundamental challenges in the world, and therefore we need to. Uh, bring in, you know, as many people as we possibly can from whatever whatever background and so on. <clears throat> and, you know, for example, to exclude women from engineering is excluding approximately 50% of the population who could who could help us uh, with developing new solutions to problems. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so I think that it's absolutely vital that, uh, particularly for an institution like ours, which is a uh, it, it's an organisation of people, uh, that we should be sort of welcoming to to everybody, um, both in the UK and internationally, um, so that we can bring to bear, you know, the whole of humanity um, to the the issues that we are dealing with. Thank you, Peter. You've only been present for an hour or so and completely on message. I, I thank oh, you. Oh, thank you. Uh, and now we have uh, Ian Douglas uh, is asking a question here. Um, We'd like to invite you to speak in the North Northern Ireland region. <laughs> so um, uh, I'd hope uh, you would accept their invitation. We're very glad to do that. Yes, we'd be delighted. In fact, thank you. Uh, and now we also have here that the uh, Japan Growth Team, which has been its collaboration of international growth, is essential. I think people can see this, and a STEM education outreach is a vital tool. What do you think to the importance of STEM education outreach um, in uh, in collaboration with international growth? Well, we, we do actually have um, a, a plan to in, uh, increase our presence in Japan. And, uh, you know, it, it's a country where the, the UK and the professional engineering in the UK, engineering institutions in the UK, have had quite long standing uh, relationships, uh, complementary relationships. So I think it's, uh, it's, it's very important that we, uh, we build on that. Uh, I, I did mention in my address that increasing the reach of the institution, I think, is an important uh, strategy for us. Um, but that's the sort of thing we need to do in a in a somewhat measured manner. We we, we can't sort of spray money about. We've got to uh, do it selectively, and uh, and one country at a time almost. Or at any one point in time, we might concentrate on perhaps three or four countries, not rather than tens or or, or hundreds even. Um, so I think um, I think that international development and finding a, a way of doing it. Uh, that, that builds on the international links that we already have, uh, I think is very important. Um, you, you've raised a, a second question on STEM, uh, and clearly um, it, it goes without saying that if we're to, if we're to build up the, the, the profession, if we're to um, uh, enable us to, to build up the teams that are required to deal with issues like climate change, for example, or dealing with um, disposal of or reuse of, of scarce materials, um, then we need to um, we need to bring in uh, you know, children from quite an early age. And as I said myself, I, I genuinely um, 
you know, thought about engineering from quite an early age and have a, I was fortunate enough to have an appreciation of what it was all about. Um, and I, I still think that there is a gap in, in, in our early to middle education systems in understanding the nature of engineering and the extent to which society is, is so dependent on it. Um, Lord Billamore talked about manufacturing being 10% of the economy, which is correct. Uh, but if you look more broadly, um, you can point to some between 25 and 30 percent of, of, uh, of the economy in countries like the UK uh, being dependent on engineering to a greater or lesser extent. Now, you've got this question from Daniel Fantoni about uh, the fact that you're the president of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, Peter. How do you see the meaning of the word mechanical evolving? Well, again, as I sort of hinted in my presentation, I think a lot of the things that we're interested in are intrinsically mechanical devices. Um, but they, they've, they've grown way beyond uh, the sort of physical structures that you typically associate uh, with mechanical products. And um, the ability to integrate control systems, intelligence, uh, analytical systems, and so on, uh, is, is a vital part. So, so I think that the mechanical engineering is, uh, although it's something that's immediately recognisable, it actually is a much broader discipline uh, than the than the name implies. Uh, but of course, with an institution like ours, uh, we the name the Institution of Mechanical Engineers is recognised the world over, um, and is recognised very positively in all sorts of different parts of the world. So I think we would be um, we would we would not be uh, serving ourselves well if we sort of moved away from from that particular name. Although I do recognise that it, I, that's a bit of a contradiction in, in what I've just said. Yeah. And now, Chris Lowther, and, and if I might, Chris, a, a question that uh, we, we, we're we pleased that you've asked, because yes, it would be Chris, which is what specifically, Peter, should the institution be doing to promote engineering in the education sector? It's been doing it, uh, if I might, in balance Chris's question, it's been doing lots of things for lots of period of time, but have we really found what the sweet spot is? What do you think we should be doing to uh, educate the whole population about engineering matters. Well, I'm, I'm never quite sure whether we we've drawn a strong enough connection between uh, the things that facilitate modern life uh, and the way they're created. Uh, and I, I think a, a lot of people are still unaware that uh, you know the, the things that surround us. Uh, I'm sitting here at the moment. There's a there's a coke can there. Well, that, that coke can is an engineering product. Um, it, it's made of extremely thin pressed aluminium, but to, to most people, it's just a, it's just a tin. Uh, and and similarly, the, uh, you, you can't see well. There's, there's food in this plastic container. Um, you know, there's engineer, engineering went into developing that plastic container so it could be produced very economically and very reliably. Uh, and you know, I've, there's a telephone here. There's a very nice camera. Which I'm hoping this gentleman might forget to take away with him. <laughs> so I think what I would like to see is, is it, as I say, a stronger connection being drawn between the, the everyday things of life, uh, engineering, and the way that they've been created so that they work well. That, that's, that's the other aspect of, uh, of, of products, is that, um, that they, sh they should be designed so that they're pleasant to use and they're reliable, they're, they're economical and so on. So I think we could explain that story rather more strongly. Now we have a question from Tony Roach about working with other uh, aspects of uh, engineering. You know, that most useful products require a systems engineering approach. What, what opportunities do you see for working with other institutions as president now, of course, uh, to improve system knowledge? Well, funny enough, uh, t tomorrow morning, actually, one of the first uh, duties I've got is I have a meeting with the Institution of Civil Engineers and the Institute of Engineering uh, Technology. Um, so I, I will be using that uh, as an opportunity to see to try to explore, you know, what further we might do. Um, we we do have a, a very real opportunity to cooperate, for example, on the climate change conference that's taking place in Glasgow in November. Um, but you know there are other things we could do, particularly I think outside the UK, uh, where it, it makes sense um, in in many other countries uh, to partner up uh, to promote the the British brand and and the, and the British um, strength in professional engineering institutions. Well, they're coming in at, at, in a rate now at different angles. Well, Andrew Williamson 
is asking you about facilities management and the need to uh, bring forward more projects on facilities management and the link of the fact that you mentioned the importance of maintenance rather than just construction and needing to understand the disconnect between design, construction and operation, in this case of buildings. Uh, what should the IMEC be doing along with SIPSI, for example, to look at cross-institution contact meetings with facilities management industry? Yeah, well, that, that, that's an interesting uh, topic, actually. When I was talking about um, sort of whole life operation, I, I must admit I was thinking more in terms of um, process, or, or, uh, process plans, for example. Uh, but obviously, in the, in the case of, of buildings, um, then the, the whole life costs of, of a building are way uh, outstrip the, the cost of building in the first place. So I, I think that the, the ability to to predict um, the, the way that um, operational costs are going to develop over the lifetime of an asset uh, and what you can do to uh, to reduce those costs through whatever forms of maintenance or care uh, are appropriate. I, I think that's vitally important and um, obviously organisations like, like SIPSI um, are very strong in the in the practical aspects of, uh, of building management and, uh, and maintenance and so on. So I think, yes, uh, it would be it'd be very helpful for our, our sort of building and construction group to, to work with um, perhaps slightly more specialized organizations like that uh, in, uh, in delivering, you know, to delivering their work. Well, Peter, I, uh, thank you very much indeed uh, for uh, unusually um, for a presidential lecture taking questions at the end of it. Normally, uh, there's a rush upstairs to the library um, to, uh, to, to to drink. Ah, uh, Keith Millard, a man who has given his own uh, presidential uh, talk, uh, mentioned the importance of increasing the number of women in engineering, an off-stated aspiration by the IMECI. Do you see opportunities for IMECI to make more progress finally in this area? Well, clearly, the, the numbers say there is opportunity because I, I think some around 10 or 11 percent of our members are, are women, um, whereas the population you know, is, is roughly 50 50. So we, we could we could improve by a factor of five. Um, the, the numbers tell you that, um, but it, it's a long term process uh, and, and clearly. Um, making engineering more attractive, more interesting to to the population at large, I think, is the is the main message. Uh, and as I said earlier, it, it's it's not a these days it, it is not a predominantly um, male manual uh, heavy occupation you know quite the opposite uh, engineering manifests itself in factories and things like that uh, you know which are comparable with 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 hospitals for example uh, in terms of their cleanliness uh, their organization uh, and those types of things so it's potentially it's a very welcoming environment and uh, I guess the critical thing is is actually when people are in this sort of formative age between probably between the age of 10 and 16, that sort of order, uh, then I think that, that that's the opportunity uh, and that's where perhaps our focus should be in terms of making the profession uh, more attractive to, to women or people in general. Well, thanks ever so much, Peter. We'll, we'll wrap it up there. I, I've taken away myself from this talk, uh, that marvellous quote where Peter said, innovation is like having a teenager. Um, it can be quite a difficult thing to manage, but it's certainly something that we all benefit from in the longer term. So, Peter, uh, President of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.